thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. It's really uh, nice to be here. I've never given a talk, I'm well, not in the presence of ministers, but I've uh, been in a conference where I had two uh, ministers uh, present. Um, so it's really an honor to be here. Um, Jan has already introduced the group. Um, so indeed, uh, I'm a professor at Kent University, but also associated with uh, IMEC. Uh, we are doing research in photonic integration, um, both on the technology itself, and my, my focus is on the technology, but I have several colleagues focusing more on applications, as I will introduce also in the talk. Uh, the historic application is high-speed telecom and datacom, but more and more people are moving to sensing, optical information processing, and quantum electronics. Um, I will immediately go to the content. Um, so, and a question, first of all, yeah, what is silicon photonics? Um, the idea of the whole premise of, of silicon photonics is that you're doing photonic integrated circuits using a process from the CMOS industry, yeah, so that you do not reinvent the wheel, that you do not try to develop <coughs> all your processes yourself, but as much as possible, you're trying to use the uh, technology the existing technology from the electronics industry, which is much more advanced historically than the photonics industry. Uh, and so we're trying to reuse the fabs. Uh, this is some pictures from the iMac fab um, to do our uh, chips. Uh, and by that, enable complex optical functionality on a compact chip at low cost. So what are photonic integrated circuits? Because I think um, some of you have a, a, a different background of, of in general, there's a quite uh, broad background here. So I'll go a little bit deeper in the uh, on the topic of uh, photonic integrated circuits and why we need them. And our inspiration, of course, comes from integrated electronics, as already indicated. Uh, everybody knows that electronic ICs are very successful because of yeah, economics of scale. You're making a lot of chips, so you use a single process to do many different kind of things. Um, performance, uh, if you integrate and make things smaller and smaller, the performance of electronic chips uh, improved. Reduction of packaging costs is very important. Um, and all efforts, of most of the efforts were in this uh, similar material. The question is then, should we do that also in photonics? Well, our answer certainly is yes. Uh, so we should move away from these complex arrangements of, of uh, optical elements on an optical table to do complex experiments and try to put them on a chip for the same reasons. Uh, and then, for example, packaging in optics is even more important. So if you can combine multiple optical elements on the same chip, you only have to package it once and you can save really a lot of money. What is a bit different, uh, different and I'll come back to that probably later, uh, performance is not always so evident. And so in electronics, uh, for a very long time, it has been trivial. And if you make your transistor smaller, it's going to be faster. In photonics, it's not always like that. If you try to combine two, three, four elements on a chip, um, yeah, you're, you're not always able to use the best material then, and, and keeping up the performance for these integrated circuits has been a challenge for a long time, but that's now uh, we're catching up there. And it's really happening, eh? so you have figures like this, this uh, more slow for photonics. Uh, we're clearly running far, 20, 30 years behind, in, in number of components uh, per chip with respect to electronics, but you see this clear trend towards higher complexity, m uh, larger numbers of uh, circuits, on uh, photonic chips. And you see there are also different material systems. You have the monolithic inu phosphide system that was historically the first one where you use three five semiconductors to make these complex circuits because three five semiconductors can do, in principle, can do everything, can be light emission, light modulation, detection, but also passives. And, but then later the uh, silicon uh, take took, uh, started uh, to become important. And also my focus here is, is this one, is where we combine uh, silicon uh, circuits with uh, three five elements um, to get the highest complexity. Application drive, historically it was telecom, and then later for silicon photonics it was r the real drive was datacom applications. So big players like um, IBM, Intel were the first ones, and then later I'll show some examples in the <laughs> next slide. Um, it really came from the datacom side uh, to drive uh, the development in silicon photonics, and basically yeah, connecting servers and data centers, uh, short interconnects between boards, uh, that's still one of the main drivers. Within that, uh, you have datacom, but also um, high performance computing. And so really, uh, and now AI uh, is, is very important, where you really can connect um, electronic systems with each other. But then, since 2000, 
then also, also new applications start to arise. Um, first of all, in sensing, um, I will show some examples, RF photonics, uh, AI, neuromorphic computing, quantum systems on a chip. And so if you look at Datacom, uh, so in the last 10 years, there's been really uh, a stunning development. I know it's, it's really completely standard to connect server uh, systems with optical, so all these yellow cables or optical cables, um, all data centers now contain really a lot of, uh, well, probably a, a data center today probably has more optical connections than we had in the whole world uh, 15 years ago. Uh, so that's uh, in including all telecom for long. And you see some very big players, uh, the Intel, ST, uh, TSMC. So this is both on the user side and on the, the FAB side uh, from all over the world. Uh, if you go to the sensing, um, there's also many examples. This is one, uh, a very simple one. Refractive index sensing, you take an optical resonator. Uh, it will come back, and I think also in one of the presentations this afternoon, if you have one of these rings, um, I don't know, I have to use this. Yeah. So this is like a, a resonator. Uh, it's a small ring, uh, radius typically 10 micrometer to 20 micrometer on silicon. Um, it, it's just a strip of silicon, but it's very sensitive to the environment. And so if you change something in the environment, you will uh, measure, be able to measure a shift in the resonance frequency of that device. Uh, and that will give you then a readable signal, which you can use for, for sensing. More popular nowadays is more so-called spectroscopic sensing, where you use a very small spectrometer. Uh, I guess everybody knows what a spectrometer is, but typically these are just big boxes. There are several of those here in the lab, uh, uh, in, in the building I've seen already. Uh, very expensive. Um, and so if you could miniaturize this to a chip, you can imagine a, a lot of new applications. So we have, for example, a spin-off of the group, Indigo. They are trying to make an implantable glucose sensor. And so for diabetes students, uh, student patients, that would be uh, very interesting if they have continuous uh, uh, monitoring of the glucose levels. And so you could continuously uh, adapt. Um, but then, of course, it has to be very compact. And you have to integrate everything in, not only the spectrometer, but also the detectors, the sources on that chip, and be able to feed it from outside. Uh, this is also this is application would be in the visible r uh, wavelength range. Mm -hmm. In the mid infrared, there is also a lot of applications like uh, measuring gas leakage, food spoilage, and so on. Uh, in this case, the optical chip. So this is already more prototype level. So there's an optical chip over here, and this is all the electronics, the prototyping electronics around it. And this is also a spin-off company of the group. So this is a company developing also again miniaturized uh, spectrometers on a chip. They're putting them in a box like that and using them to read out fiber BRAC grating sensors. And so fiber BRAC grating sensors are gratings embedded in a fiber. And if you pull that fiber, um, the grating and so will uh, change the period. And again, that will give you a measurable signal. That technology is known already for a very long time. Uh, but again, the readout units were very expensive. So they couldn't be used in, in a lot of industrial applications. By miniaturizing the readout unit, and so this is no, yeah, it's a package like this. Costs 500 euro instead of 5,000 euro, uh, what is the current prices. Um, you can use it, for example, in windmills. And so if you have a windmill blade, you put a fiber along that uh, windmill blade, and it starts vibrating. It gives a signal through these gratings to, to a readout unit like that. And that's then a price which, is a f uh, which you can uh, afford for individual windmills, detect earlier breakages, and so on. Uh, I'll skip this one. This is an, an example of a more complex chip um, developed in European, well, already several European uh, projects. It's a complex interferometer which allows, it sends out an optical signal uh, and measures then the reflected signal and lets it interfere. And that allows to measure, for example, uh, small vibrations. And in this case, what is measured is the, the pulse of the, uh, the main arteries over here. By that, you can measure then the, the speed of the blood passing through your artery, which can be translated in, yeah, is the artery, uh, are you sensitive, uh, is, uh, are you uh, um, having yeah, artesclerosis or something like that? So it's for the early detection of uh, heart diseases. But here we have an example. So the chip itself, uh, you see it's pretty small, five by two and a half millimeter, and most of the place uh, is actually empty because it's uh, ready to put a laser on top here. So the, the active circuit is very small. 
uh, then it goes in a system like that. In the meantime, it has evolved already, so which in principle uh, could be used by every uh, GP at, at his uh, practice. Uh, and then newer applications, uh, so you have, for example, programmable uh, photonics. You probably know FPGAs, uh, programmable el electronic chips. So you're also trying to do this in electronics. So there you need already much more complex circuits. Uh, neuromorphic computing, uh, so AI type of chips. Again, you see very complex chips where signals are sent in, recirculate, so have sort of a, a memory effect, and are then read out to do data analysis and so on. And then the, the newest, uh, and then it's very rapidly rising, is uh, quantum processing. This is not from our own work, this is from Bristol, a chip. But again, the need for very complex uh, chips, a uh, lot of nonlinear optics, uh, very, very low losses, and you work with single photons to combine everything. So every line over here, you have to see it's, it's like an optical waveguide um, combining everything. Um, current, well, a bit more in detail now in the technology that we're using. Um, this is our standard waveguide still. It's from the beginning we had this dimension and still very much is, at least in the, the silicon waveguide range. Um, so it's a piece of silicon, uh, typically 500 by 220 nanometer on a silicon oxide substrate. Uh, so we're using SOI wafers because you need to isolate the high index uh, waveguide, uh, waveguides from this substrate. Losses are about yeah, one to two dB per centimeter. Um, and that's, that's okay for most of applications because the chips are of that order also. So we can live with that. Fabrication, um, yeah, you could do this with EBIM in a university lab, but most of the fabrication is done in silicon fabs uh, on 200 millimeter or 300 millimeter wafer, such as uh, I made in this case. And you can make relatively short bands with that. Uh, so in two micrometer, you can make a 90 degree band. Uh, more complex circuits like this um, on-chip diffraction grating to make spectrometers. So this is the basis of the spectrometer application that I mentioned. And so um, you have an input waveguide. The light is diffracted on the chip to a grating. And then uh, depending on the, the the wavelength, the color, light is se separated over different channels. In this case, four channels, but you can easily expand that to more channels, uh, like is shown over there. Um, this is an example of these ring resonators. Uh, you see on the top here, uh, the picture is not, oh, I have to move forward there. Uh, so this is the ring, uh, this resonator again, where light can circulate. And of course, if you have, uh, if the length of that ring is equal to the wavelength of the light in that ring times an integer, you can have a resonance and the light will uh, interfere constructively with itself and you have these sharp peaks in the wavelength range. Uh, that were all passive functions. You can then do active functions like uh, detectors and then the typical material to be used there is germanium. That's known in the CMOS fabs. So it's not a standard process. Eh? It is needed to be developed for silicon photonics. Um, but still, most fabs were familiar with germanium so the germanium detector is now the de facto standard and it has ve very nice performance, uh, more than uh, 60 gigahertz. I think here it goes to 50, but in the meantime, people have shown yeah, more than 100 gigahertz bandwidth for these type of detectors uh, being optimized. Um, also modulators. So silicon has no natural electro-optic effect, and so no pocus effect, if you are uh, familiar with that. Um, so you have to do something else to change the phase of the light going through that um, waveguide. Uh, and that can be done by injecting carriers or basically moving carriers around in the silicon waveguide. And again, that's something the CMOS industry is very familiar with, of course. Uh, every transistor, there's nothing else than moving carriers around. So in this case, for example, this is an example from uh, IBM, no global foundries. You have a PIN junction. You inject carriers through that junction, uh, change the refractive index by that, and that can, can be used in an interferometer to make a modulator. So in summary, so this is the type of platforms which are now offered by several fabs. In this case, this is from the, the IMIC uh, offering. You have on these 200 millimeter wafers a complete platform with all kinds of uh, components, active components, uh, to couple in light, to, to transport light, or to modulate light and detect light. Uh, this is on silicon. And most of what I've told before was on silicon. You also have similar activities, for example, on silicon nitride. The advantage of silicon nitride is that it's transparent. 
also at visible wavelengths. In silicon, you know, has a band gap of uh, just above one micrometer. So everything below one micrometer, you cannot transport light. But then you can use silicon nitride. And you have the same type of components also there. And silicon nitride is also a material very commonly used in the uh, CMOS industry. Um, and yeah, so again, historically, the focus was on wavelengths 1.3 micrometer, 1.55 micrometer, because these are the wavelengths used in fiber communication. So most of the work initially was developed there. But by now, we are moving, as I just said, uh, to shorter wavelengths using silicon nitride. Also to longer wavelengths uh, using germanium on silicon, because silicon oxide is no longer transparent if you go be beyond 3 micrometer. It's also in the mid-infrared, there's a lot of optical applications. And more recently, you know, also going to the UV with aluminum oxide, uh, because silicon nitride then also has a cutoff over here. And all these materials are very well known uh, in the CMOS industry, so you can just use that technology and transport it to the photonics. There's of course still some challenges, otherwise we wouldn't be here and uh, would just uh, go home, let's say. Um, we don't have a good light source uh, yet. And so in everything I described, um, uh, I didn't talk about light sources yet. If you go, well, no. Uh, so that's, that's an issue, and that's because silicon has an indirect band gap so it's not an efficient light emitter. And the same for people have tried with germanium, but also that is, remains very challenging to get good light emission from silicon or germanium, group four materials in general. So we need a solution for that. And also, yeah, I showed these phase modulators. They're good. Um, they're using really the standard technologies are very uh, well developed, but it's, yeah, they have problems like AM, FM uh, cross modulation. So if you change the phase, also the amplitude changes which you often don't want, um, high, high power consumption, something relatively large. So also there we need better materials. But the main drive is really the laser amplifier. That's the, the, the main missing block in the standard. I'll, uh, and then yeah, this, yeah, in, in this industry, the standard for making lasers amplifier is 3.5 semiconductors which have a direct band gap, which can be very uh, efficient emitters. So the question is, how do we get these three, five semiconductors, these lasers, uh, on the silicon photonics industry, uh, chips? And the initial, and, and still used in, in, uh, by several companies, the initial approach was flip chip integration. Uh, so you prefabricate your laser in a three, five uh, foundry, do all the metallization, um, and then take them I put them then on top of your silicon photonics chip. And so this is an old example already, but there are several companies uh, doing this approach. It's, it works. Uh, for medium volumes, this is more than sufficient. Uh, you can pre-test the lasers, so it's uh, certainly um, a, a good approach. But if you really want to go to high volume, or if you really have tense integration between the amplifier and the uh, silicon photonics, for example, to make more complex laser devices, yeah, it's not the best approach. And then from the beginning already, uh, people like us, but also Letty, UCSB, Intel, developed a process based on dye or wafer-to-wafer -wafer bonding, where you take your 3.5 wafer, your silicon photonics wafer, and you put them on top of each other. So the active layers of the silicon, uh, of the 3.5 the are bonded on top of the silicon. You remove the substrate, and then you end up, I think I have some pictures here. Uh, so this would be the silicon, this is this bonded inuphosphite dye, uh, which is still thick, but then you remove the substrate and then you end up with something like this, where you have on your silicon wafer, three, five gain layers, which are a few hundred nanometer to a few micrometer thick. And those you then can again process like a standard silicon photonics wafer. Uh, this has been done successful. Uh, in particular, Intel is using this process in their, in their products. Um, we also developed it for a very long time. Um, the challenge is that here this whole processing of the 3.5 material has to be done also in the CMOS foundry. And that's quite disruptive. Uh, so Intel could do that because they're a very big company, they have a lot of resources, they have their own foundry, that's okay. Uh, but for smaller players this is, is not, not practical uh, to go in that way. Um, and that's why we and others came up with an, uh, an approach which is somewhere in the middle between those two. It's called transfer printing, uh, where we pre-process part of the 3.5 on, uh, on its native wafer. We also have the target silicon photonics wafer. 
And then we are unrichting the tree 5, and we are using a polymer stamp to transfer methyl from the source wafer to the target wafer. Uh, so it looks a bit the same as this uh, flip chip, but the big difference is that we are, um, yeah, we are transferring tin layers, yeah, so not fully uh, processed wafers, so we can uh, have much denser integration. Uh, we can also use multiple of these, post uh, we can transfer multiple uh, of these elements at the same time. Um, so it's, it's really something which is sitting between flip chip and, and, um, and bonding, so it combines both the, uh, the advantage of both approaches, uh, we believe. So this gives a little bit more detail on how it works. And you start with this source wafer with the 3.5 device layer on a res layer on a substrate. You pattern the device to whatever level you want. Um, you embed it in photoresist with tethers, which are uh, here. Um, let's see. And so what you have here, this thin blue layer um, is actually locally patterned so that you still have access with then an agent to the yellow layer. And so in step D, then you, um, <laughs> we're trying to move over here. So in step D, you put this in an agent, uh, typically a red agent, where you can remove the release, la release layer. And then the green active layer remains standing on the substrate. You can come with your stamp, pick it up, and transfer it on the target layer. You can recycle the substrate, which is a, an added advantage. Um, and in that way, for example, we make this type of tunable lasers here schematically given. And so we have a source wafer with a very dense array of amplifiers. You're, uh, I think on a, on a pitch of less than 50 micrometer, while in a flip chip you would need at least 250 because you all need to individually cleave them. Uh, you take one, you put them on a silicon photonic circuit like that with again these two ring resonators. So we have two resonances which act as a filter. And by aligning them, you can select a particular wavelength. And in the middle, then you have a gain block on a silicon wave guide. And you can make this type of tunable lasers where you have a, a wide tuning range. Here, uh, something similar. So again, this is really now a silicon photonics substrate. Uh, it's, a, it's a microscope picture of a real uh, chip. So here, um, this is a 3.5 block, an amplifier block. Here you have like tapers, that's like small pins in the, in the, in the 3.5, which push the light, the light down to uh, silicon waveguides, and then it's recirculating. Here I think it's easier to see. Um, somewhere over here, and you have this ring resonator, the ring resonator, which is all tunable. And then ultimately the light goes to this big modulator on the silicon photonic circuit to, to yeah, control the signals. Uh, this is the output, the spectrum from the laser at different types of settings. You can also do much more complex things like these Morcock lasers. So these are lasers which uh, give very short pulses and, and giving this train um, of uh, frequencies in the spectrum. Um, work very good because we have, we can, yeah, it's very stable. It's, it's on a chip. Uh, if you, typically this is done with an external cavity. It's difficult to keep this stable. So here it's all fixed on a chip, so very robust, very stable. Uh, and you can then use that to do like this dual comp spectro uh, spectrometry in the infrared. Uh, this is an example with our chips where you measure here a CU CO absorption uh, uh, peak. And we'll not go in detail on this technology, um, but it's, it shows that these lasers can really are mature enough to start being used in applications. And then newer applications. Uh, so when this is um, where the collaboration with Ljubljana comes in. Uh, this is a, a project which started uh, two years ago um, called uh, UTP for Q, so micro transfer printing for quantum. And so now we have again a substrate, a waveguide substrate, in this case silicon nitride. What we want to do here is transfer not standard sources, but single photon sources in gallium arsenide, uh, from gallium arsenide quantum dots on this chip as a source, but also uh, single photon detectors. These are superconducting detectors, and then lithium nitrate modulators to control the phase of the light. Um, and we're working together uh, with Janus Group to uh, design these components, um, optimize this coupling, and then transfer. The, the material. Um, I'll skip this. Yeah, so apparently some slides that I <laughs> took out uh, are still here. Uh, so these are some results after printing. What 
this is um, so we have one of these grating coppers to couple light in, in the 3.5 Gallimarsenite material over here. Then you have a very thin strip of Gallimarsenite. Uh, this taper again. And then the, the double line uh, in a sense. Maybe it works better here. Um, for example, this is a silicon nitride waveguide. And so the, the idea is really that you couple light from a quantum dot, which is sitting over here, through this narrow tip through the silicon nitride, which is, yeah, you can see the dimensions better over here. This is the narrow tip which is transfer printed on the silicon nitride waveguide. And this works also. And so uh, we see really that we have transmission from the silicon nitride to the uh, uh, 3 5. I will not go into detail on what you see here, but uh, it seems to work. And so we're on a good way. Just to finish off, I uh, still have five minutes or so. Um, so the light source is very important, um, but also phase modulators are important. Um, the motivation, yeah, well, I already uh, sort of said it. So um, we have these silicon photonics modulators by injecting current or uh, depletion modulators, where we have a PN junction, which we put in the reverse bias. Also, in that way, you can change uh, the, the, the charges. Um, but you have this... Um, really an intrinsic trade-off between efficiency, loss, and speed, and no pure phase modulation. And so that's why um, people are now looking at alternative materials. And so uh, there is a whole zoo of materials that you could, again, integrate on silicon using different methods, but in our case, preferably, again, this transfer printing uh, to achieve those effects. And so lithium niobate is uh, the most popular material for the moment, because historically lithium niobate modulators in bulk then have been used, uh, were the, the uh, let's say, the main technology to modulate light in telecom systems. Uh, but those were bulk modulators using diffused waveguides of 7 micrometers large, uh, I think uh, about 10 micrometer cross section for a waveguide. Um, diffi difficult to scale up to really high speeds and not compatible with this uh, silicon photonics. Um, so we need a new technology for that. But then there are other materials like PTO, PZT, polymers, which have an even larger electro-optic effect and, and would be nice to integrate. But people also are looking at graphene and 3.5 devices. And so there has been really an explosion of this type of uh, work over the last few years um, from different groups all over the world. Um, something happened with, exp yeah, with the presentation. I'll have to skip some slides because uh, uh, that's already... So the, the first result on lithium niobate uh, came from Harvard. Uh, well, the, f the first one which really uh, got a lot of, of attention. So they're using pure, still pure lithium niobate. Um, so no silicon photonics, no silicon nitride. Um, but it's sort of like SOI. And so it's lithium niobate on the insulator. So it's a very thin layer. And they, for the first time, managed to etch low loss waveguides in lithium niobate. It's a bit of a difficult process, a material to work with, but they then showed very high performance uh, modulation. Uh, but not integrated with silicon waveguides, and that's then where we came in. Uh, so a few years ago, we showed that also with this transfer printing technique, you can transfer lithium niobate. Uh, here, the, this is the lithium niobate film. On then, in this case, a silicon nitride waveguide. So this interferometer structure you see over here, uh, is the silicon nitride. So again, we are coupling light here. We are splitting light in two paths. One goes through the lithium niobate. This, the phase is modulated, and then here we are recombined, and that allows to modulate light on and off. Um, and by now, yeah, also at high speed, uh, up to 70 gigabit per second. You can also, this lithium niobate is also very popular for uh, nonlinear applications, uh, as you see here, an example. Um, but I will not go in detail. We are also, so this is, was all transfer printing. We're also using an, uh, a process and in, in collaboration with other colleagues where we have a sol gel process to de deposit PZT. Uh, PZT also has a large electro-optic effect, but also piezo, uh, a piezoelectric effect. So that also can be used to change a phase in these waveguides. And so here, the nice thing is that you can uh, just spin coat this material. The, what is special is that PZT is, in general, it's deposited on platina. But platina and light, and metals and light in general, 
it doesn't, that's not good marriage. Uh, metal induces a lot of loss uh, in, in waveguides. So what my colleagues found was a, a special intermediate layer uh, um, uh, based on a lanthanide um, that could be, which is a dielectricum, so which is low loss and which could be directly posited on top of the waveguide and then allows to uh, deposit a piece of T which has a preferential orientation and still gets a, a good electro-optic effect. Um, I'll skip that and I think, well, just uh, for the, the last one. So also graphene uh, has been um, used a lot now over the last 10 years to make to try to make amplitude modulators. Um, if you, yeah, you know that if you have a sheet of graphene uh, that absorbs quite, uh, and light is incident on graphene, light will be absorbed. But by shifting, by applying a voltage uh, over a graphene layer, you can shift the Fermi lever and you can make the material transparent. In general, if you have normal incidence, you absorb only 2%, which is a lot for a single mono-mode layer, uh, but not enough for practical applications. But then if you put the graphene sheet below your waveguide, you'll get much more absorption. And then if you can control that absorption, you can make a modulator. And that's what we did historically just on standard waveguide small chips. But very recently, we showed also that this could be done now in the fab on 200 millimeter wafers. So this is a very strong collaboration with IMIC also, really in a CMOS-like uh, uh, of process. Um, well, yeah, this is, this is, for example, this transmission curves. Eh? So you go from very high losses and then you apply your voltage and you see that the loss, that it becomes transparent. And I will stop here and uh, go to the conclusion. This should not have been there, but uh, sorry, I copied the wrong presentation from it. So silicon photonics is, is really booming, I would say. It's still much, much smaller, of course, compared to the electronics industry. Um, but big founders are really taking this up. And we have some remaining challenges, but there's certainly still room for uh, new work. And with that, I'll uh, I think acknowledge my colleagues and stop the presentation. Thank you, Dries. Thank you, Dries, for a very nice overview of the activities and uh, applications in integrated silicon and other type of uh, integrated photonics. So now it's time uh, for questions. Please, Professor Batagin. Hi, thank you very much for a very nice overview. You stated that the number of the connections, uh, ports in data center is increasing today. Uh, normally, the most common technology is also the cheapest one. Do you think that this technology which we use nowadays in data centers will transform to the, let's say, standard telecommunication links? So, I mean, the, the chips, the technology that you are developing for data centers will also jump to the long distance links. Um, I think it, it remains, uh, I think it's used in some, uh, some link, probably not the, the, the uh, below C links uh, where you really want uh, the highest, highest performance, but in metro links, there's already silicon photonics uh, being used as far as I know, mm -hmm. uh, but it remains in competition with other technologies. Uh, so you have still the, the whole field of 3.5 monolithic is still existing. 3.5 uh, modulators are also uh, very good. So it, for the moment, it remains a competition between the two fields. And it, yeah, I think this feels my merge or um, it remains to be seen which one will ultimately win for which application. Uh, but uh, I, there are companies like there was Acacia um, and also Huawei did a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. What they are actually using, but I, I know they did a lot of effort also for metro applications. So. Is that, uh, yeah. Any other questions, comments? Can you also comment the energy efficiency of the, uh, let's say, photonic chips comparing to the electronic chips? Is, uh, are the photonic chips more uh, energy efficient than the electronic chips? Is this can be this the advantage of the technology? Yeah, I think that's the main, the main advantage. Uh, that's the main breaking point. Uh, so there's still, you have this uh, boundary 
I'm not sure where we are at this moment in the episode. The, the distance over which uh, photonics became more interesting than electronics to do transport. Um, no, this boundary no, no, has been about moving. About the integration, about the chip. No, I, I understand the transport, yeah. Yeah, but, but uh, no, you have to look at the system as a whole. And, oh. so, and, that, and that's where my colleagues from the, um, yeah, at IMEC, for example, do a lot of studies all the way. So if you look at the system as a whole, including the, the, all the electronics that you need. So the, the photonics are not using any energy compared to all the electronics that you need, for example, at the receiver side for your TIA and then the whatever you need. So the main energy is, is over there. And so you, you have people do the study of, if I have a link, it uses a picojoule per, uh, per bit, for example, this point for, for, di for a given distance. And, and I think that's the main, uh, cost is, is important, but cost and energy are also very closely linked. Um, so it's, it's really dominating the choice between electronics and photonics is, is dominated by energy consumption. So um, yeah, maybe a bit confusing, but it's, it's very important. And so, um, but yeah, and as you mentioned, so it's important to look at the link as a whole. And so not the pure photonic part of the chip, but yeah, all the electronics. Are much more important. So if you, uh, sometimes you see reports for these ring resonators, it's a few fem to joule per bit energy consumption, but that's not a fair statement because that's purely the ring itself and not taking into account uh, the driver circuits that you would need. And so on. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, maybe a naive question, but um, you showed it with this um, uh, polymer transfer. And there is some residue left on these uh, components when you lift off the stamp. I was just wondering, uh, just in general, um, how does these effects of residue from the lithography and stuff like that affect the performance of these uh, systems? That's a big part. Yeah. You mean so the, the thing? <laughs> yeah, the tethers yeah. that you mentioned, tethers, but also yeah. like so you also showed other um, structures which were made with lithography. So I guess um, there are also some residues there, I would imagine. Yeah, in general, you want to avoid them. And so, for example, in a transfer printing, so a lot of the work, uh, so the process looks very simple, but uh, a lot of the development and the know-how is in designing these tethers. Uh, I can show top views, I think. Uh, but design that they are breaking, not as a, uh, not below the chip. I know it's moving back and forth. Um, but they really break above, and so that they, if they would break below, and then, and then you push the dark, the, uh, you push it down again, then the bonding will not be good. And so it, it's really a lot of know-how in, in ensuring that if there are residues, that they are at the, ri at the right place and not hurting your process. And then trying to develop finding a good compromise between these tethers have to be sufficiently strong um, but you still want to be able to remove them afterwards in an oxygen plasma or whatever type of process. Ah, so you do cleaning. Yeah, yeah you, need, okay. you need to finding the, the compromise in the cleaning processes and so it's very important also. Most, well, a lot of the work has been done with resist tethers but the companies then you're talking with, they would prefer to use uh, the electric tethers using like uh, a silicon nitride layer um, instead of a photoresist layer to, to hold the chip. That's still considered to be cleaner. And, uh, so it's, yeah, it's a big uh, question. Okay, thanks.